Long Wolf, hot and sweaty. I've just come out of the snake room, been tending to the snakes and the other reptiles, um, checking on the hatching snakes, checking on the baby snakes. Um, this time here especially becomes a bit full on. There's lots of them to look after. And if you're gonna do it properly, that takes up plenty of your time, especially when you're actually working full time as well. So why do I breed snakes? Well, why, do any, why does anybody breed snakes? Well, there's, there's a variety of reasons. Um, let's delve right in, let's look at some of these beautiful things and I'll talk you through some of the stuff we've got and some of the really good reasons why I breed snakes as well as many other people. Enjoy the video. Two hands for this so those eggs don't roll. Bit of blue beauty and some good eggs there. I think the main reason to breed snakes is because I remember when all the snakes in the hobby were all wild caught. Some massively over collected in the wild and in most cases certainly when I was younger they arrived to the UK from Africa, South America, Central America, North America in a really bad state and many of those animals died. Captive breeding takes the pressure completely off wild take. Once breeding animals are well established in captivity and snakes like these mangrove snakes from Asia, these guys really have only been captive bred in any sort of numbers in quite recent years indeed. So a snake that until recently has been taken from the wild in relatively large numbers, often not doing well in captivity. Now we have many, many species of mangrove snake, all, avail all available, captive bred. Healthy, parasite free, stress free animals. And that for me is the biggest change in reptile keeping in my lifetime really is the, the availability of captive breeding and that to me is a huge conservation aspect of breeding these creatures in captivity. Further on those lines, crested gecko, something else that we breed here quite regularly. One of the most popular reptile pets, one of the most bred and understood reptiles in the hobby. Bred all around the world in numbers as captive bred. This animal was extinct in my lifetime. And then some years later, in the 90s, a few were found on their island, taken into captivity, bred in numbers to help them survive in the wild because their numbers were down to almost nothing. They now do well in the wild, and the offshoot of that is, we don't need to collect them from the wild, because these guys are bred by all manner of hobbyists, from experts to beginners. They were extinct in the wild through natural reasons, not man-made, not from nothing to do with collecting from the pet trade. All zoos around the world keep and breed rare and unusual animals. They are now arcs for animal life because many species of animals are only nowadays in captivity, extinct in the wild with animals being bred and surviving well in captivity and that gives us a gene pool that if we can correct the wrongs that have made them extinct in the wild, mostly man-made, these extinct in the wild animals that are bred in captivity can be repatriated. Many, many, many examples of this 
superb conservation happening. First one that pops into my head is the Mauritius Kestrel. The Crestu Gecko, another prime example. Wonderful pet, wonderful creature. Her boyfriend is now 13 years old. And he, bless him, is still going strong. Look at these false water cobras. This is where it really began with me. So grass snakes, one of the first snakes I ever kept and bred in captivity. And they were wild caught grass snakes when I was a lad from the local fields. But the first snakes that I really tried, captured bred snakes that I grew on from babies like these, that I really tried to breed were false water cobras. Successful off the bat the first time and I've bred them nearly every year since. I'm a couple of females and a male. We've got hypos here or pale phase ones. And I can tell you now, that one there, I'm keeping back if she's a female. And these are normal phase here. Beautiful little snakes. And the, the real love of this is the fascination. It adds a whole different aspect to just keeping snakes. So I bred these every year. And this is the norm with young snakes. They usually go into individual enclosures to feed and grow on. This year, we're trying something different. We treat them like I would garter snakes and grass snakes, and we're keeping the young ones all together to begin with, fed on a saucer, a variety of foodstuffs. It means I can't monitor them individually, but I can tell which ones I have been feeding just by feeding their tummies the next day. And we're seeing if, just like with garter snakes and grass snakes, if these false water cobras feel more secure in a group, and I tell you now, observations already, yes they do. These guys are still sticking around with the camera stuffed in their faces. Very often, snakes kept on their own when they're young, much more nervous, because at the end of the day, if you're a snake baby, everyone, everyone wants to eat you. Frogs eat you, birds eat you, snakes eat you, lizards eat you. People don't usually keep these together because in the wild they do eat other snakes as part of their menu and snakes that eat snakes are often cannibalistic. But these aren't wild snakes. These are snakes that have more opportunity to feed. And my experience is most of the time they're not likely to eat each other if well fed. Only time will tell. Aren't they beautiful? Surely that gives you some insight just looking at these beautiful babies as to why people love breeding snakes. So, are we breeding to make money? Well, some people do make money from breeding reptiles. Usually those people that breed colour morphs of often very common species, but the collecting human being often pay a lot of money for something that's a colour or pattern no one else has got. That's just human nature. But for me, enables me to swap, trade, or sell, so that I can buy more, more unusual snakes in my collection, like this gorgeous Eastern Black King Snake. Look at this. So when we say financial gain, selling off some of our hard one offspring in many cases, of course, most people that breed these snakes simply breed them to finance their interest in snakes. So I wouldn't be able to afford to have brought a pair of tiny little baby black-headed Australian pythons without exchanging or selling some of my offspring to finance that. So it enables me to keep wonderful, wonderful creatures and have that challenge, get back, have that challenge. So we've just produced 
baby black headed pythons for the first time from my pack. And my goodness me, the roller coaster ride that is breeding the more rare and unusual species. I've learnt an awful lot. I've had a lot of help, mostly online from people that have bred this species before. Up to this point, Jason Luke has really been a great mentor in Australia, helping me out, people sharing kindness and knowledge. Well, what I learnt from breeding black headed pythons was that my pair carry genes for various colours, exanthic and albinos. I have also learnt that almost no one in the world hardly has albino. <laughs> Get back in there, black headed pythons. And I've learnt the reason for that is because the gene that, if you like, gives them their al albinism is probably a weak gene. All of mine failed to hatch, so they grew in the egg to full size. I'm going to put pictures on the screen. They grew to full size, but failed to survive the hatching process. What a shame. Of course, next year, we'll try again. Wouldn't it be wonderful just to get something completely different, as we spoke about before? Although... Of course, this natural coloured male black headed python is way better looking than an albino black headed python. Simply again, the rarity value of colour morphs kicks in. It'd be lovely to have an albino because it's different. If they were equally as common, honestly, I wouldn't have one. This natural coloured Australian python, absolute stunner. Look at that, a head like it's dipped itself into black ink. So two survivors from 10 eggs. I started off thinking I'm a failure on these this year. First year I bred them. But of course, if those two survive, that's a huge achievement. When it comes to all the people breeding snakes in the world, there's plenty more people that breed black headed pythons, but there's not that many. Again, the fascination, the interest, and that learning curve. Have a look in here. Look at this. Grey banded king snake. Once a rare, wild caught, very expensive import. Now, being bred around the world, including here in the UK, this little baby, captive bred, hopefully be paired up in the future with another great banded king snake that we can breed here look at it outlandish what a gem color morph bred in captivity this is this is a wild species of snake in its wild color look at that an absolute gem a real cool classic but the next snake i'm going to show you the holy grail of colubrid snake keepers. But it's ready to shed its skin and she's gonna he's gonna look rubbish. But let's look at something even more iconic than a grey banded king. So look at this. An eastern indigo snake, the holy grail <laughs> what am I eye of colubrid snakes just about to shed its skin, looking absolutely rubbish. What a shame. This snake potentially growing to eight feet long. Incredibly rare in the wild highly endangered captive breeding is going to be its saviour if it has a saviour in the wild because unfortunately for this snake although it was once highly collected for the pet trade habitat destruction building roads building buildings where this snake comes from in the eastern United States is devastating this snake's wild population it needs a large range to complete its brumation to breeding and so on cycle in the wild. And when you've got freeways, buildings, apartment blocks, industrial units, cutting these ranges in half, a snake like this, like many species, massively suffers. Thank goodness there's people in the States breeding this incredibly unusual and beautiful species, the Eastern Indigo snake, releasing them in the wild, tagging them in the wild to try and find out more about how they live and how you can help them. Breeding snakes in captivity is conservation in action 100%. And of course the key thing is 
keeping quality animals in captivity, trying to keep an eye on the gene pool, because although many snakes in the wild inbreed in many populations, too much inbreeding can really ruin the genetics of any species. You are gorgeous, even though you look done and drab. This snake was my 50th birthday present to myself after seeing one in a book in primary school. And I can tell you now, if I didn't breed snakes, there's no way in the world I could have afforded to buy a captive bred Eastern Indigo snake here in the UK. Fantastic. I think for me, the real hook of breeding snakes is a whole new learning curve. Learning is what drives me on and fascinates me with all the things I do. So I've bought incubators off the shelf for reptile eggs. I've made incubators from old refrigerators, which work fantastically. But this year, I've trialled most of my colubrid snake eggs here in the ambient temperature of the snake room, which is around 27 to 28.5 degrees centigrade. And everything so far is hatching really, really well with no issues of issues at all. Still some bull snakes to come out there. And again, a learning curve different substrates we've got hatch right we've tried perlite we've tried coir shredded coir we've tried all sorts these ones are just waiting for some hatch right on slightly damp tissue paper towel i might leave them on there and one thing i'm finding is actually a lot of these snakes common or rare the colubrids if you do some basic things with these eggs like not let them get wet keep them the right way up keep humidity about right substrate choice doesn't seem to matter much at all if that substrate is used correctly. The fascination, the learning, and the great reason to breed these wonderful animals. Now, of course, if you're breeding snakes, by the very nature of it, you're keeping more than one individual. And of course, many people will tell you to always keep your reptiles separately. But by keeping multiple individuals, as part of your breeding program, you can try things for yourself, not just learn it parrot fashion. So this large enclosure is home to two pairs of Vietnamese blue beauty snakes. And I can tell you now, as long as I've got multiple hides, a stack of hide boxes there, and enough room, these fantastic, absolute stunners <laughs> thrive kept communally absolutely thrive and go through all of their natural breeding behaviour without any fuss you do get to see the males size each other up and spar now when they spar snakes don't bite each other and just see how it goes on and then once the breeding season over, is over these guys just chill out together and the only thing I watch is that feeding time so they're not squabbling over the same food item but Vietnamese blue beauty snakes kept together communally absolutely thriving have a look at this snake well I can't do it justice because it's not in the sunshine the rainbow boa look at that Collected from the Brazilian Amazon, nowadays born in captivity. Beautiful, beautiful snake. Captive bred perfection. And in another year's time, this snake we've had since she was sort of the thickness of a pencil, should be more than large enough to breed. And again, something we can produce here for other people to enjoy learn about study taking the pressure off wild take look at those beautiful iridescent markings or iridescent sheen many of the really beautiful snakes had a really high value when they were wild caught and you can imagine why what a thing to behold 
And of course, high value means high pressure on animals in the wild. Captive breeding, producing them relatively easily, has brought the price down and took the pressure completely away from the need of wild tank. Now, of course, it's not just snakes that were wild caught. Tortoises, terrapins, crocodilians, all kinds of invertebrates, certainly tarantulas and lizards as well, were all shipped from tropical and subtropical parts of the world for the reptile keeping hobby when I was a kid. These beautiful Spanish eyed lizards, the largest European lizard, these were all wild caught. Wool lizards, green lizards, wild caught imports, and nowadays many many people are working with these kinds of animals just like there are with snakes breeding these fantastic reptiles in captivity just like the couple i have now here in the uk our climate's a bit naff but species like this from europe in a well thought out enclosure can be kept outdoors and that's where these guys are destined to go they're going to get full on sunshine and UV rays. Fantastic species. The only trouble is with an eyed lizard, often outdoors, they become much more naturally nervous and wild, whereas this guy here usually comes running out to see whatever's in my finger. Here he comes. A blue worm. Now he says blue worms are not for tea. Wonderful, wonderful species. Now, some snakes not super difficult to breed and maybe for a beginner things like the milk snakes and even these bull snakes sort of follow quite a basic pattern of relatively trouble free don't get me wrong stuff goes wrong but very much we make them over winter pair them in spring eggs will be laid Couple of months later, all being correct, the eggs will hatch and the young generally feed well within sort of their first offering, but beautiful as they are. So, some king snake eggs here due to hatch on the same day, so they're almost ready. And these guys are hatching now, beautiful baby bull snakes. So when I say these animals used to be all wild caught and they came in in bad condition and many died, this still goes on. This is an animal that in the whole of the world, available in a reptile keeping hobby, is only available wild caught. Almost no one is breeding this species in captivity, but there are people managing to do it now. This is a European legless lizard or glass lizard shelter pusic whatever you want to call it this is a lizard not a snake it has ears it can blink it's a three cut two thirds tail snakes just got a little tail look at this animal these have come to me i've got five of these they've come to me via a reptile rescue they were imported declared by the importer not fit for sale dumped to the rescue and they've come to me Look at the state of them. Wounds, bad collectors and bad exporters don't care about their animals. They don't get fed, they don't get water, they get treated badly, they end up with internal and external parasites, and they end, look at that guy, with bacterial skin infections as their body starts to break down and the damage they've sustained, it struggles to repair. These have been treated internally, externally, they're still being treated for their skin lesions. They're being fed a huge amount of food on a varied diet. That alone will help them, as will, of course, rehydration. The reason I have these, because now there are people that know how to breed them. We're gonna breed these if we can keep them alive and thrive. They're gonna spend the summers outdoors from next year in a glazed outdoor enclosure with lots of room and then the following year, the following year, not next spring, 
we'll breed these guys, I'm sure of it, because now we know how. This is how reptiles came into the reptile hobby all the time. Parasitized, parasitized dehydrated, terrible bacterial infested wounds. Still goes on. Doesn't always go on. Because good importers, good collectors do things differently. So wild caught, I'm not saying we shouldn't ever have any wild caught reptiles, but we need to respect these things if they're taken from the wild and it needs to be licensed and sustainable, which it is in many countries. If you love YouTube reptile videos, check out DM Exotics. He shows how it's done. His wife speaks the language in Thailand. They live partly, I think all the time now in Southeast Asia and they still specialize in exporting wild taken reptiles as well as captive bred stuff. But having the language, having the on the ground knowledge of the collectors and exporters and more importantly, being an all round good guy that actually cares makes a huge difference these guys, they didn't meet someone like that. Luckily now, they've met me. And hopefully, go on that one. Hopefully, this battered individual and its four buddies, equally as battered, will end up thriving and living a outside life as of next spring. Obviously, please hit subscribe if you can. Please like the video if you can if you liked it and please if you would like to comment below it's all interactive with youtube but it all helps forward this channel my god there's something coming down the stairs i'm off thank you very much for watching